Tante, boujou, and how you doing? It's me, Rosanna Deerchild, host of Unreserved and your favorite cousin. Well, it's that time of year. Leaves are falling, the weather is cooling, and pumpkins are everywhere, from front yards to coffee cups. Now, I love a good pumpkin spice latte as much as the next person, or not. But come October, I always feel a little uneasy and more than a little queasy as to what is waiting for me out there. No, I'm not talking about Halloween per se. I'm talking about those horrifying costumes. You've seen them. Princess Pocahontas, Reservation Royalty, the brave Cherokee warrior with the plastic tomahawk and all its ilk. Yes, you too can be indigenized for the low, low price of just $29.99, oppression not included. Now, as Indigenous peoples, we come from beautiful cultural backgrounds. Many non-Indigenous people admire. I mean, I get it. The beauty in our culture and traditions fascinates you. There's just one problem. We are not costumes. Let me explain the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. What exactly is cultural appropriation? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Cultural appropriation is when someone takes elements from a culture not their own and remakes and reduces it into a meaningless pop cultural item. I'm thinking hipster headdresses, tribal face paint, and yes, those so-called Halloween harmless fun costumes. It's not harmless fun. That headdress, for example, Traditionally, a headdress is gifted to leaders who have earned the right to wear one. Receiving a headdress involves ceremonies and protocols and is considered to be a sacred item. And it takes many years for these leaders to earn one. And that Pocahontas and sexy buck outfit? Well, they play off dangerous stereotypes of indigenous people as mythical and historical creatures that once, but no more, roam this great land. Like the Seminole, Navajo, Kikapu, like the Cherokee, I'm an Indian too. Cultural appropriation can be harmful because it is an extension of centuries of racism, genocide, and oppression. Cultural appropriation treats marginalized cultures as free for the taking. So not cool. On the other hand, cultural appreciation truly honors our nation's arts and cultures. When you appreciate, you take the time to learn and interact, to gain understanding of a culture or cultures different from your own. It is a cultural exchange based in mutual respect. The key is consent and participation. If it is about us, then it must include us. A few ways you can truly appreciate Indigenous peoples and culture know our history. I don't mean just yours or mine, I mean our collective history. So we truly understand where we come from and where we come together. Remember, appreciation good, appropriation bad. And this year, let's all have a happy Halloween. Bye. 
we have a term kuliana which means responsibility to be a kumuhula that's a huge kuliana the Hawaiian people did not have a written language and it was the hula that kept all the stories alive and I take that responsibility of perpetuating the hula very, very serious. It's your one song of the night. You're only dancing one song. People say, is hula pastime? Is it a hobby? The hula is our bridge to the past, the foundation of our Hawaiian people. It's my life. Sixty women have to tell the same story. So we have to dance as one, think as one, our souls need to be as one. There's a time in our history when hula was forbidden. That was a sad time in our history. But King Kalakaua said, the hula is the heartbeat of the Hawaiian people. So where there is Hawaiian people, there needs to be the hula. Velina Mai Meke Aloha e Kalehu Lehu. My name is Trish Wisenhunt, and I am a member of, of the Community Outreach Committee for Ka'aha Lahui, O'Olekona Hawaiian Civic Club of Oregon in Southwest Washington, a nonprofit organization with a mission to actively participate in the promotion, perpetuation, and practice of the Native Hawaiian culture and values. 
One of our goals is to participate in activities which promote the civic, economic, health, education, and social welfare of our community, and particularly the activities of those agencies and clubs who are responsible for the improvement of the conditions of the people in the community. Through these efforts, we would like to welcome Nakamali Talk Story, a program offering a safe place for open discussion and conversations around social justice, equity and equality, cultural appropriation, climate change, and education that will be led and driven by today's youth. Cultural misrepresentation has been an issue and a conversation topic for years. As community leaders, people of color, and those who actively participate in our traditional cultural practices have been faced with a challenge to rise above the cultural appropriation we continue to see day after day, month after month, and year after year. Many would argue that these issues have been around for as long as the media have given life to the idea that our regalia is a costume but the term only emerged around the 1980s. The simple definition of cultural appropriation is the adoption of an element or elements of one culture or identity by members of another culture or identity. Although there is a term or a form, definition, form of definition for cultural appropriation, it doesn't make it okay. We can think of many examples like sports teams with Native American mascots or names, people misleading the value of traditional dances and languages and other instances where there's lack of respect for cultural significance. Stereotypes, another issue we often discuss, have affected most if not all people and the youth of Nakamali Talk Story would like to bring to the table these conversations. Conversations they have tried to have within their education systems with peers who find their cultural name funny, or with their educators who take their cultural question lightly. So in celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, today's discussion honors the many Asian and Pacific Islander youth who continue to rise above and uplift, uplift the voices of their kupuna. And for all the youth that want to learn more about culture, we say, stand strong, make your issues known and raise your voices loud. With that being said, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Kahoku. Mahalo and teachers. Aloha, my name is Kahoku and I'm a sophomore in the Ryushin School District and my pronouns are she, her, hers. On behalf of Now Come We Talk Story, we welcome you to what we hope will become a safe and open platform for many of our students and peers. Before we get started, Today's talk story is a community organization here in Oregon. We would like to acknowledge and mahalo the land and its people to which we sit and occupy. Today and all days, we honor and acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. Mokohonu is the Inua of the people of Hawaii call these lands of North America. It is simply translated to Turtle Island, but the meaning and indigenous stories of these lands or so much more. The Lenape story of the great turtle is shared by the indigenous people of the Northeastern woodlands and carries throughout all of North America. Through these stories, we continue to learn about those who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. We would also like to express our appreciation and respect of the indigenous people's inherent kinship beliefs when it comes to the land especially since those beliefs were restricted for so long. As members of the BIPOC community, we know the importance of acknowledgements and we encourage you to learn more about the lands we currently occupy by visiting native-land.ca. The United States was built on broken treaties. The lasting effects of federal and state policies both past and present have put Native Americans at a disadvantage for hundreds of years. It is on all of us, whether we are descendants of colonizers or inhabitants of stolen land, to re-educate ourselves and each other. Ayola. Today, we continue to uplift the mana'o of acknowledgement by sharing space and honoring Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As youth leaders in our communities, we understand that bringing awareness to these certain issues are important. Before we begin today's talk story, I would like to introduce and welcome our very special guest who will be joining us today. Auntie Heather is an enrolled tribal citizen of the Central Council Tinglet and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska. She's a wife, 
mother, and a community advocate who is driven to make visible the existence of Indigenous people. As the education program manager at the Confluence Project, she helps to bring Indigenous voices into classrooms across Oregon and Southwest Washington, and also provide teacher workshops for educators wanting to align with tribal history slash shared history, SB 13, which requires Indigenous history to be taught in a classroom through the voices of the nine tribes of Oregon. Caring for Indigenous people is deeply rooted in Auntie Heather's core. Her purpose-driven passion includes making space for others to experience a fuller and more accurate understanding of Indigenous existence and of, our, and of our unique histories. She's involved in multiple Indigenous organizations, like the Portland All Nations Kunun family, where she is a board member and, and puller. She is the first woman to lead the Alaska Native Brotherhood which is one of the world's oldest indigenous civil rights organizations, which was established in 1912. And she serves on multiple advisory committees where historically BIPOC voices have been absent. Auntie Heather holds a bachelor's degree from George Fox University in management and organizational leadership. And she is currently pursuing her master's of arts in indigenous education from Arizona State University. Her daughter, JJ Lowey, is a citizen of the Cordialine Nation. She's a sophomore at Century High School in, in Hillsborough, Oregon, and will be attending the early college program at Portland Community College, PCC, next year. JJ serves as the youth board member of the Portland All Nations Canoe family, has been an officer for the many nations as one youth council with NARA Northwest and is passionate about caring for the needs of our community. She has been involved in many advocacy activities, supporting education around missing and murdered Indigenous people, Indigenous civil rights, and has recently started to volunteer as part of a team educating teachers about tribal history slash shared history, SB 13. JJ loves to participate in cultural activities and anything that involves caring for our elders and children. Aloha, Nancy, Heather, and JJ. Kumo Kaula is an inspiring educator and a motivating facilitator, a community leader, and a kumuhula, a devoted daughter, a dedicated sister, and a loving Nancy mom. Ha'aha, humility, ohana, family, and aloha, love, are values that were instilled in her at a very young age. Nancy Lei was born on the island of Wahoo to a family of cultural historians and entertainers. Nancy Lei moved to Moku Okeabe at eight years old. She chose to attend Ke Kula O Navio Kalani Opu'u in memory of her grandmother. She immersed herself in the language. It was her grandmother's wish for her to learn her native tongue. She's a proud graduate of Ke Kula O Navio Kalani Opu'u, class of 2001. This accomplishment was followed by her pursuit of higher education in the Pacific Northwest. In 2009, Nancy Lei founded Halal Kalei Halia Okalokalani in Aloha, Oregon. Her passion to educate the next generation was her dream, and she set out to answer the call to make a difference through culture. For the last 13 years, she has dedicated her life to igniting the passion in her home mana through hula, spreading the value of community through outreach in local public schools and establishing a new generation of thinkers through social justice and initiatives. Aloha and Chile. Born to dance, founder and Ra'atira, Nancy Roxy Tavai Morales has been a pupil of Hula, Tahitian, Samoan, and Maori dance styles since she was six years old. She has dance trained and competed in Hawaii under the direction of Nancy Tahia Parker with Mariana Boracay. After moving to Vancouver, Washington with Nancy Tahia's blessing, Nancy Tavai opened Ora Nui Tahitian dance troupe and continues to share her knowledge and love of Ori Tahiti with the Northwest. Growing up in a very artistic family, it is no surprise that music became an outlet for Nancy Charlie Okada. She has danced hula in Ori Tahiti since she was a little girl enjoys a good jam session on the ukulele, guitar, or drums, and has even done a few musical plays. 
After graduating from the Art Institute of Portland with a bachelor's in fine arts, Char Auntie Charlie has helped her sister run Ora Nui. She's usually the one organizing the events, the paperwork, and the accounts, but still prefers to have her feet dancing across the studio floor every week. Daughter to Auntie Roxy, Amika Malen, Mal sorry, Malen, has been dancing from inside of her mama's old pool while her mother still danced herself. At the age of 15, she was given permission and blessings to teach Ora Nui, Ora Tahiti, from her Ra'atira's uh, Ma Mawahi Nui. Mover and Joanne Nilo, she now heads Ora Nui Tahitian Dance Troupe in Vancouver, Washington. She was also immersed in the Maori culture through Tahia with Toi Avihiki, Te Fare Tu Tawa O Te Aotearoa, Lebe Matua Kim Makekau, in the Samoan culture through Salea Dance Troupe under the, under the direction of Tusi Salea Lang, and Mauka Mu under the direction of Mika Hele Ololoa and Isi Tolo Ololoa. She is currently dancing hula for Kalehalia Oka Lokelani under the direction of Kumuhula Lealoha Kaula. Mika believes that it is important for the youth of today to participate in cultural practices so that the Polynesian cultures are kept alive for future generations to come. Aloha aunties and Mika. Mahalo nui loa to all of you for being here today. I would like to open today's discussion by asking the first question. How are cultural misrepresentation and cultural appropriation different and how are they alike? Are they the same and how are they connected? We would like to start off with MC Heather and JJ. Ganachish, thank you so very much for having us. You know, this is such an important topic and I wanna thank you for bringing it forward and providing a safe place to talk about it because it is something that is systemic, it's built into our communities and um, by bringing awareness and conversation to it, it helps to educate. Um, and not to shame people, but to educate. There's so many things out there that um, we just have built into our societies that we haven't questioned. Um, the stereotypes drive that, right? So the misrepresentation of culture um, and appropriation of culture have been things that have been happening for hundreds of years for our, our, our Indigenous people and all BIPOC people. Um, so to me, and I don't speak for all Indigenous people, I don't speak for all Klingit people, um, but for me personally, I feel like cultural misrepresentation is taking a culture and framing it through a stereotype. So um, you might have heard of the term Pan-Indian before. So Pan-Indian is a term that describes all Native people, that we're all the same, that we all live in teepees, or for Alaska Native people, that we all live in igloos. We don't all live in igloos. <laughs> people still ask me now, even to this day, when they find they find out I'm Alaska Native, oh, do you, did your family live in an igloo? Well, no, my family has never lived in an igloo. Um, our tribal houses were tribal longhouses. I was from uh, my family is from Southeast Alaska, not up north where they actually do use igloos. So that misrepresentation and that misunderstanding through stereotypes is is where I go to when we talk about um, cultural misrepresentation and then cultural. Um, uh, appropriation, that was the other question, right, or the other part of it, is exactly what we saw in that video, where people take pieces and parts of a culture and take it on for their own or use it for their own benefit and use it such as uh, to make, you know, clothing items that have tribal designs on them and, you know, even say that these are real tribal designs or um, totem poles, you know, for me, my people, my Shlingat people, we, ha we have totem poles that we have used since time immemorial to tell our stories of our clans and our families. And you can see them on shelves, you know, and they all have that little tag on them that says made in China. And they're these, these fake totem poles, you know, even thinking to like the term, you know, low man on the totem pole, there's a stereotype and a, a connotation that's built in through these systemic issues that makes people think of that as the worst place to be on the totem pole, whereas actually it's a very, much a place of honor to be at that place on the totem pole. So I hope I answered your question a little bit from my perspective. JJ, did you want to share?
Um, um, one second. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry, but is it okay if I um skip this question? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Why did anybody else like to answer the question? Yeah. Uh, we can go off of what um Auntie Heather was saying, just with like the whole totem poles so like in the Hawaiian culture and all of Polynesia, we have ki'i or tiki's and just seeing them used not in Walmart, how they should be used <laughs> in Walmart. Yeah, like places as like that as souvenirs. And really our ki'i was of our gods yeah. and it's not something that should be put on Walmart shelves. It's not something that should be up in your house for decoration. That's how we feel. It's they were sacred for us. And um, that's upsetting whenever I see people with tiki's all over the place. And tattoos. Or our tattoos. Or our, yeah, or, or our tattoos and, you know, having them on their body and not really knowing the mm -hmm. meaning behind it or the money that their tattoos carry. Um, it's not all of it is for looks like a lot of it has has heavy meaning behind it and mm -hmm. i feel like people don't really go into research of their you know their tattoos or their tatal and also doing the research and finding the right people to get it from mm -hmm. yeah you yeah. Mahalo. Um, I really understand because um, there have been times where I've been asked, oh, do you, when I say I dance hula, oh, do you dance in coconut bras and grass skirts? And I've always have to correct them and say, no, that is not what I do. And so I, yeah, I really understand that. So thank you very much. Um, our next question, question comes from Mema. Mema? Aloha. Uh, my question is, what inspired you to become a cultural practitioner in Tile? Mahalo, Mima, and you know, again, mahalo for all of you folks for being here and and sharing your manao um today. Like Auntie Heather was saying, this is a definitely mahalo to all of you folks for bringing this to light and giving it giving an opportunity to have a safe space to to share our mana'o as far as cultural misrepresentation. So um, to answer the question, what inspired you to become a cultural practitioner? Um, for for me, it's, it's life, right? This is, the, this is the culture I grew up in. Um, being Hawaiian isn't just, it isn't just a little box on a paper. I don't just check every day. I don't wake up every go, check, I'm Hawaiian. No, I am who I am. I am my koko is Hawaiian and I live and breathe Hawaiian. So to become a cultural practitioner was not a question. It wasn't something um, that you wonder. It's, you know, just like that video that was shown is Koleana. And we have a responsibility and a great conversation that I had um, multiple times is when we ask, people ask us, you know, what does it mean to be Hawaiian? And it means what it means to be Hawaiian. And if I speak, I think I could speak along with many indigenous cultures, it's responsibility. We have a responsibility and an obligation to our poe, our people, to be able to carry on their traditions. Because um, if we don't do it, then who will? Right? If we don't, if we don't pass on the knowledge, then who will? And if if for those of us who had the privilege or had the opportunity to learn and we don't share it it will die with us. And, and that means our culture will die as well. So that inspiration, if you're looking, that's what inspires me. It inspires me every day to continue to teach and share because, you know, why should, it, it is a blessing to have been able to learn. It is a blessing to have been able to grow up in hula and Hawaiian language. And it is also a privilege. And with that privilege comes the obligation and the responsibility to share it. So, that's what inspires me so that I know that when I look to the future, when I look to Kahoko and her brothers, I know that um, our people will live because of them. Our, our culture and our traditions will carry on because of, of students like you folks, like the community talk story, the people who are, who are carrying these, these spaces for us. So 
and I will hand it off to the next person. I guess we can go because we can just follow up right after her <laughs> as well. Um, so for us, with being a cultural practitioner, what kind of driven us to be cultural practitioners? I think we feel as if we we grew up being cultural practitioners, you know, and we grew up in Hawaii and the culture is all around you. It's hard not to be cultural practitioners there. You grew up in your everyday traditions. And so I kind of feel like it's naturally within us to be cultural practitioners. Um, as far as coming here and teaching, um, we just wanted to make sure that the culture is carried into the future for the future generations and so that our culture never dies. I mean, how sad is it when you are when you look to the future and you don't see your culture there and it's just taken over by stereotypes and <laughs> all this other craziness. <laughs> and, um, you know, when I moved from Hawaii coming to the mainland, it was a really hard decision for my husband and I because of our kids. Like we didn't want to take them away from that. So for us to make sure that we're continuing in our everyday traditions, um, whether it's dance or if it's them singing the national anthem, the Hawaii national anthem every morning at the fly, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. It's and just really making sure that we olelo at home with them. They learn all their meles and everything like that. And even with Tahitian, it goes all the way around. And this girl was involved with Maori, someone, and you know, with us being mostly Hawaiian, we really wanted to immerse our kids in the cultures so that they could be people to carry on the culture for the Polynesian people, because mm -hmm. not many do, yeah. so. Thank you. Um, for me, especially after we moved up here to Washington, I realized how disconnected uh, Kiki and the youth right now is from their roots. Don't cry. She's crying. Guys. <laughs> I'm a really sensitive person. <laughs> so then that inspired me to want to. Um, help not just the youth but like anybody of any age to connect back to where they're from and the roots and stuff. It's okay we go. <laughs> She's passionate. <laughs> Charlie. Uh, okay, I think that's it for us. Well I would love to answer if I can too. Mine will be brief, um, which doesn't happen often for me. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't raised uh, Klinget. I'm Klinget and I'm Dutch. So from my mother's side, I'm Klinget and Dutch from my father's side. And because of many things, my mother left when I was very young. So I always knew I was Alaska Native, but I didn't know what that meant because my dad didn't know what he didn't know. So I, you know, saw books and I heard the stereotypes and I learned all the things we learned in school growing up, but I didn't really know. And But I was hungry for it. It was in me and I knew it was a part of who I was. And so as I got older, as a teenager, I started to dive into that more. Um, and then through my 20s and 30s. But, you know, in my 30s, one of the most profound moments was when I was at a conference and an elder, he's um, since left us, his name was Frank O. Williams III. He was asked a question about how do we keep our culture alive? And how do we keep our youth involved in culture? And he stood up um, and spoke and he, he didn't speak clearly all that much at that point in his life, but his message was so clear that day. And he said, we need to make sure that we aren't just putting our culture on a shelf, like as a piece of history to look at in a museum and revel and be in awe of, we have to take down those parts of our culture and live with them and have relationship with them and not just remember what it was like to carve a halibut hook or to carve a totem pole or carve a dugout canoe. We need to actually do it and live culture every day. And that might just be saying one word in our language. It might just be talking to somebody about your culture, but you have to live culture every day. And so for me, um, as a cultural practitioner, that's something that I try and do and I try and model for my kids too, is like even we pray before each meal and we say, um, thank you creator for this food. 
Aho, amen, and Golach Chish and Limlech. So we tied in their language and, and our language and our reference to Creator. So even in our thanking for the food that we're blessed in, we're making sure we're tying in our piece of who we are as, as cultural people. So that was a mission for me when when um, that elder shared that because I was kind of struggling at that point in my life of like, where am I going within my culture? How am I serving? What am I doing right now? Because um, I didn't feel like I was making a difference that I was just existing in my culture and not living in my culture. And so from that day on, it was like my daily charge. I'm not just going to look at my shelf and look at the pretty artwork I have. I'm going to live it and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And that's hard being a suburban indigenous person. It is hard, but it is a part of who we are. So um, I just want to share that. It, it, it's not necessarily a conscious effort always for some people, but sometimes it is. It's that that aha moment. And for me, it was when our elder, Franco Williams III, just reminded me to live culture every day. Yeah. Yeah. Mahalo to all your responses. I understand that once born, you do have the obligation to being a pra um, cultural practitioner. Even the simple things like if my mom or Auntie Lay are talking to us in their tongue of their ancestors and responding back is one of the simple things or eating the food of your ancestors and just tuning into the conversations that they may have that they share with others. And so through this, I also see that some people take the title of being a cultural practitioner as an advantage in benefiting themselves, you know, sometimes through money and um, especially through media, which we'll get to later on this talk story. So mahalo for making me realize that. Yes, thank you very much for sharing. Um, our next, we have Kule. Aloha. Um, if Auntie Lee would like to start with this question, how has cultural misrepresentation impacted you and your personal life, if you don't mind? Oh, these guys! I have to, I, I have to go in there, in their script and be like, "Hey, stop asking Auntie Lay first. No, just kidding, just kidding. I love you guys. I really do. Um, how has cultural misrepresentation impacted my my life, my personal life? Is that the question? Is that what we're? Yeah. Um, you know, on a, on a personal level, I guess if we're just talking about misrepresenta cultural misrepresentation, um, personally, it's upsetting. You know, that's the impact that I would get in on my life as, as far as when you look at that. Um, you know, but the other part of, of cultural misrepresentation and how it's impacted my life is that it's been my driving force, especially now living here on the continent, coming from Hawaii, being, being raised in our, our Hawaiian culture and, and Hawaiian language. Um, it's been the driving force of all that I do through halau, through... Um, through Kalei Hali O'Kalaklani and then, you know, through the work that we do, do with our youth, through the work that we do through Halwa, our, our, our summer programs, and of course now being able to, you know, participate with our Hawaiian civic clubs and and um, different other, other Pacific Island organizations that are here on the continent to be able to um, collaborate with them on ways to correctly educate people. Um, you know, when it comes to cultural misrepresentation, sometimes we have to be mindful on how we address the issues, right? And so when you ask me, how does it impact me? I think especially for a lot of you who are with me, you know, you guys know how it impacts me. Um, but I have to be mindful on sharing that information. And, and it's very upsetting, right? It's very upsetting to be here. Um, for example, um, you know, I, I'm going to be that person who does it. I'll call out the city of Beaverton. You know, the city of Beaverton, where we are, a Beaverton school district, there has been so many opportunities for them to be able to reach out to us to teach Hawaiian culture the correct way. We have reached out to them to teach Hawaiian culture the correct way. And to this day, we are still fighting to be put, to, to have a place at the table, to have a voice to be able to stand up and say, no, it's not okay to um, to theme your event a luau. 
and have all of these fake things at the, it's not okay it's not okay to ask my halal to perform at a school function when that is the theme it's it's you know and it, it's that's the part that's upsetting you know we've now been here our halal has been here for almost 13 years and we're still having these conversations we're still trying to get into our education our, our the, the system and again you know the other part of that is that you know history works against us right it is not their it, it there's a part of that that's also not their fault they're not we are not in their education. We're not in the books. We're not in the histories. And, and I'm sure Auntie Heather will also, you know, I've, I've been to their confluence conferences and it's true. We're not, we're not being represented. So there's that part of it where people are not, they don't know. Right. So it, it's the, and that's the conversation. They're like, well, we didn't know. Okay. Thank you. You didn't know, but you do now. And what are you doing? And so how that impacts me, that's the driving force is, is, now that you do know, what are you doing? Like, you know, I ask you folks the same question, right? Like, now that you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, how are you guys, how are the youth in your own schools participating in ways to make sure that culture is being represented correctly? And, you know, you folks have done many different things. For example, you know, Kule, I'm sure, you know, when you have those conversations with your peers about it. And so it's it's very that's the driving force you folks you folks are the driving force of of how mis cultural misrepresentation impacts me and color my i will then talking too much go ahead and next Any, anyone is welcome to answer um mm. I, I don't want to take up all the time, so I'd love to provide space for the others uh, if they want to go before me, but I have an example I do want to share. Oh, okay, go on. Sheesh. Well, I have a bunch, but <laughs> the one that I want to share, though, is one that I look back on. When I, I moved to Alaska in my early 20s, I went to college up there for a while, and I got a job at a chowder house, um, not thinking anything of it, and was a waitress. And I worked with an amazing uh, co-worker, and she was from up north. So in Alaska, you say up north is up north. I was in southeast Alaska. So she was from up north in one of the villages. And on my first day, when the tourists came in, she's like, oh, come on, come on, come on. We have to go out in front of the counter. And I was like, what? Why? <laughs> you know, why? She's like, we have to take pictures. And I was like, take pictures? She's like, for the tourists, they want pictures of real Indians. And I, I was 23 at the time. And uh, I was in shock because I was coming from Beaverton, Oregon, where I grew up with my Dutch family and had some influence, of course, from my indigenous side, but hadn't lived in my communities like when I was in Alaska. And I couldn't believe that they were taking pictures of me to show their friends on what was slideshows back then, but on their, their pictures and their photo albums of real Indians. And I think about that all the time. And I think about, wow, like how how was that okay and what could i have done differently where i was at in my life to not participated in that stereotypical for lack of a better word uh, um I don't, I don't even know what to say but how, how do i prevent that from happening to my children and other people i know it's by sharing that and saying hey it's okay to say, I'm not comfortable with you taking my picture or I'm not comfortable with you touching my regalia or I'm not comfortable with you being in my space and learning to advocate for yourself because I was in so much shock. So that entire summer, I can't even tell you how many pictures I took. And, you know, I'm a light skinned indigenous person and I'm sure <laughs> people just are, I, I, I still am just blown away that people wanted that just because they were told I was, Alaska Native. So regardless, I mean, it's just people fall into the stereotypical systemic belief systems that they've been, have been perpetuated in their lives and they'll just go with it. And I can't imagine ever going somewhere and saying, oh, hey, you're, oh, you're this culture. I need a picture of you. Click. You know, it's just, it's not humanity. It's not humane. And it's that invisibility of our Indigenous and BIPOC people, right? So we're, in, we're invisible to people unless they need something from us. And that's an example of that. So I talk to my kids about it. I talk to people about it all the time because I don't think it's right. And 
it needs to stop. And so how do we make something stop? We talk about it and we offer alternatives and we offer education and we offer a place like this to have conversations about these hard topics. So um, that's just one of my, my things that I always go back to when I think about how has it affected me personally? So thank you. I know I already spoke, but can I share one more thing? Could I do that? Yeah, sorry. Because Auntie Heather just brought up a great one. And um, this actually just happened to us. When did Hoku and I were going, um, she had to go and get her vaccination. She was, so we were at, we were in Hillsborough, we were at Walgreens. And the Walgreens, the pharmacist there was like, you know, they had to take all our information. And so they're asking, oh, you know, what race? And so, Kahoku goes, oh, Native Hawaiian. Native Hawaiian. And we had some folks behind us who were sitting there and they were so in shock. They were like, wow, these are actual Hawaiians standing here. And they just stared at us like, I, I don't know, I felt like I was like on display. And they were so excited to sit next to nat actual Hawaiian people. And you know, did did we did we come here? Like, are are you from here? Are you? And it was just it was it was very um for, I mean, of course you get upset, right? And what do you do in that moment? Like, do you act back or do you rise above so that your your sixteen year old who's standing there learns from you and knows that no, you don't go and just attack this. You stand proud. And you don't let that be the 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 factor that makes you upset. But it was it was pretty um interesting because as Kahoku and I sat there and waited for a vaccination, we literally were on display the whole time sitting there because we were native Hawaiian sitting in Walgreens and they don't see that often, apparently. So um that's something that could impact us and it's also okay for us to look at them in a way like do you need to stare? Because you can take a picture, but we—I mean, we don't want you to. But this is what's happening. Like it's—it's it's like we were at the zoo, but Kahoku and I were, and I don't want to say animals, but we were the animals just sitting there, special, and everybody staring at us. So, but, and that's what I want to share. Well, I don't, I, I just want to add to that if I can really quick, because I think it's important. The systemic issues continue, you know, even outside of these face-to-face -face interactions. Um, you know, we were doing an intake for a program and the person asked, like, um, asked, like, how, so how much are you really into your Native American culture? You know, it, I was in shock. I wanted to, I'm not usually a big reactor, but I took a second and I said, well, we're indigenous. We live our culture every day. It's who we are. And the person said, well, well, how into it are you? And I wanted to say, that's like asking somebody like, how into your white or Latino or Russian or whatever, fill in the blank culture are you? And it was really a moment where I was thinking, wow, they're really this continues to happen and the education is important. So of course, me being me, calm down, <laughs> said, um, you know, yes, we are indigenous every day. We wake up indigenous, we go to sleep indigenous, we live our culture every day. But later I had a conversation with that person that continued on and it was very graceful, I believe. I, I believe I was kind to them. And just saying, you know, that the way that that question is asked is actually quite offensive. And I gave my reasons. And I said, it may, I understand that you're doing your form and what you're told to do, but maybe it's time to rethink that form. And how can that form not offend people? It could be a question like, how can we support you within your culture? So it's those changes in the words and that education and the conversations that are really important. So even with people at the grocery store or, you know, how do you how do you help shift their lens and it's through education and hopefully hopefully we'll get to a point where we don't have to but these conversations again i go back to this it's really important so thank you again thank you so much for sharing those stories um
it definitely made me think about how education definitely plays a, a role in cultural misrepresentation and lack of education as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing those stories with us. It was good to hear how these things are still happening, even though it's 2021 and we've been work we've been working on this for a while. But yeah, we can, definitely can do better. I think our school systems can do better. Um, one thing for me is that I totally agree, but one thing is that um, I use my computer for many things. Sometimes, sometimes my name on my screen changes. So at school, I go by Angelia. At home, I go by Kohoku. So one time, I forgot to change my name, and it was Kohoku. And so my homeroom teacher, I was being let in. She's like, oh, you're Angelia, right? And I was like, yes. And she's like, you always come up with so many funky names. And I was like, okay what does that mean exactly i didn't know my hawaiian name was funky it's the name i was born with so yes i do understand that aspect and that some we need to re-educate some people our next question goes to noelani thank you uh mahalo nui um my question for today is, does it seem as though people's viewpoints of a culture can be easily changed? And for those youth that encounter people who sort of, um, what's the word, uh, misre or well, don't know about their culture very well and see it in a different light than they do, how would you uh, like, in correct this person, no, well, not correct, but help them see their culture in a different light. Um, and then to start off, uh, could Auntie Tevai or Mika, Auntie Charlie start off? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm okay. Especially in like the era that we live in, social media plays a big role in influencing people and not just like Instagram and Facebook, like even the news and stuff. The things that they say, a lot of people just believe it just because it's like on official websites or TV shows and stuff like that. And they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's how it is, I guess. And then that's where stereotypes come in and everybody just believes it. But like for us, um when we do like performances and stuff we're kind of like correcting them because most of the time people come to us asking for hula <laughs> and it's funny because like on our website and everything we throw out the word tahijin or ori tahiti everywhere <laughs> but it's like they're like huh i wonder what that is it must be the same as hula apparently and we go there and when we do our shows we don't usually just do Tahitian, but it is our main focus. It's so like Auntie Nini or Auntie Charlie, our MC, she likes to take our audience on a trip throughout Polynesia. And she starts off with, okay, well, we're going to start off in Tahiti, you and know? This is where the Tahitian dance is from. Yes. Right? So, like, really um, educating the difference and showing, like, no. Like, is it Tahitian? No, Tahitian isn't hula. Don't call it the same thing because it's totally not the same. Yeah, we make and it then, a point to educate at every performance and show them yeah. the beauty in every single uh, culture and that they're separate. You know, we're cousins, we're all linked by the ocean, but we all have our own specific cultures and to um, recognize that and to be able to distinguish between the three or yeah. the, the different cultures that we yeah. do at our shows. It's like when we moved up here, yeah. um, it, it was, was okay. It was new for us when people called us islanders <laughs> in general. <laughs> and that included like Polynesians and like Micronesians and Melanesians and everything. And we just like, wow, we're islanders now. <laughs> 
So like, she's taking this to a whole new know, like different so time. She will just ramble on and ramble on. <laughs> um, I think the whole misinterpretate or misrepresentation and um, social media that she was talking about at first and how it changes the views of people. Um, when you look at, we can even use dancers, for example, like dancers, if they're well known, then that's what they're going to look at, like the youth or whoever, it, you know, people who don't understand, they're going to look at that and be like, oh, that must be, you know, what Oisinti looks like because she has all these followers and all these people and they all love her and stuff like that. Or, she claims to be like, and she claims sick. to be whatever she claims to be. And like, I feel like that, um, that's one of the huge ways that, um, were misrepresented or mm -hmm. were fill it in, Charlie. <laughs> um, the way that you can change people's views. Yeah, their views of what it is, how it's supposed to be done. Or I mean, it's always changing. We know that with times comes change and stuff like that, but you don't have to stray so far away from what it's supposed to be. And tradition should be kept tradition. Yeah, like. but like the social media can also be used in a good way. Like not just, oh, now everything that we see is fake, that isn't real. Yeah. But we can use it to show people what it really is, to educate, to educate them through it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, by the way, if we totally went off yeah. topic. <laughs> My train of thought just goes. <laughs> No, that's completely fine. You uh, said some very good points. Um, does anyone else have anything to share? <laughs> Auntie Heather, Auntie Lei. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think, uh, so going back to the question is really thinking about how, um, how change can happen, right? And I think, again, I go back to what you all are doing here. This is how you make change. You provide space for um, respectful conversations and welcome people into the circle to have those conversations. But if it's face-to-face -face and in person, it's a little different than a, a planned webinar where you have an idea of what you want to ask and what the responses will be. So in person, too, you know, I'm... <sighs> I try to be as gracious as I can with people and understand that they're coming from a place where they don't know what they don't know um, and providing an opportunity for them to make a mistake if they and for them to correct their mistake, because I know I make mistakes all the time and um, to be that gracious um, opportunity for education for somebody and that they'll take it if they want it. Um, sometimes people won't and they're stuck in their ways. I think about when my three kids were little, we were at Craft Warehouse and um, the kids were being silly and we we're just having fun. And the lady walked up to us or walked by us and said, why don't you just go back to your country? And my kids were little, little, <laughs> but for me, I was completely in shock. And I couldn't believe that this person said that to us being indigenous, even though we're not of the land that we're on. And we're so grateful to be on the land of the Twelve and Kalapuya and be able to live, serve and live our lives here and be stewards of the land. But for me, I'm not normally a reactionary person. But that day when she went after my children and said that about my children, I said, <laughs> I did say something to her. And I didn't say it offensively. I mean, those who know me know that I'm not like a outwardly reactive person. But I did say, you know, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Um, we are on our homelands. She didn't need to know the details of where we're from. So I'm not sure where you want us to go back to. And she looked at me in such shock that she didn't even know how to respond because she was so used to living in her bubble and her stereotypical, and I'm gonna say racist bubble, that she couldn't believe that somebody actually said something to her and called her out on it. And so I don't recommend people do that necessarily. Um, I felt like it was the right thing at that moment for me, but those things happen to us. And just like Auntie Leigh was saying, even getting a shot, you know, we don't know where these things are gonna pop up and how we're, going to react to it, but we, we can plan how we participate in it. 
we can think about how do I want the future to look and how do I want my children's future to look? And then we can make these steps like providing spaces like this to have conversations. And even with the work I do at Confluence, you know, we do, we bring indigenous voices into classrooms, into community, but also with the teacher workshops, um, I work with a lot of teachers who admittedly don't know what they don't know. And so providing space for them to learn and to grow and to also understand that they themselves have culture, that we all have culture, we all come from somewhere, we all have people, and to understand who we are as individuals helps us better understand other people. So it's just really finding spaces to share and connect um, and just to continue to grow. So I'm very hopeful. I'm a hopeless, optimistical person because I believe in our people. I believe that creators put us here to, to live in harmony and, and be with each other in community. And um, I'll continue to help support any way that I can um, education and awareness to the best of my ability. And I hope my children will do that too going forward. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that would like to be shared? Um, if not, then thank you so much for your answers. Uh, but it just, I think it's very important to keep in your mind the fact that if you encounter someone like on the streets and they don't know what they're talking about, then it's just because they weren't necessarily educated the way you were or that they don't know as much as you do. So to, simply lash out at someone just because they have their facts wrong isn't the right thing to do like you need to approach it from a different aspect like you need to be conscious and aware of the fact that they didn't learn what you learned so you need to present your information in a way like that they can understand it and so that they can possibly learn something new or maybe you could be the first of helping them see whatever they're talking about in a new light um, so I think it's very important. Thank you. Mahalo. Um, our next question comes from Sophia. Uh, uh, mahalo kohoku. Uh, my name is Sophia. Um, and my pronouns are right here, which is really cool. Uh, the question I have is, when seeing a school or sports mascot that is misrepresenting one's culture, especially yours, what is your initial reaction? Um, maybe this this can go to anyone, but maybe Auntie Heather and JJ. What was that? Okay. Well, you know, this is something that, um, you know, is very much in the media. We see it, the changes that are happening with like major sports teams. Um, and, you know, for me, when I see it, my view on it now is definitely different than it was even just a couple of years ago. Um, my view now is, you know, first of all, I'm like, wow, they still are doing that. <laughs> like, I thought that changed. I, what happened there? Um, but now, you know, it, it comes up in different ways too. So like in Hillsborough school district, where we are now, they were trying to name a new school. Um, in North Plains, and it's been called Opfilati Ridge, which is the name of the, the people who inhabited that land since time immemorial. But in school board meetings that were recorded and open to the general public and their work groups, there were some school board members who brought up some of the history of the Opfilati people, which, you know, it, it was true, absolutely, but it wasn't um, the same as... Um, other other situations. So it was about how some indigenous tribes actually had slaves and it was part of the culture. And it wasn't the same as the enslavement that happened where people were brought from Africa and enslaved and put into servitude in the way that they were. But they used that as a reason that they didn't think that the these people were good and they shouldn't be represented in the name of the school. And they had this whole argument around it. And so it, it was kind of the flip of like seeing a mascot, but it was like somebody who's saying that you can't do it because of something that they've prescribed um, thought to or, or their, their perception to. And so fortunately through conversation and through conversation with our parent advisory committee with the school board um, and the tribes of the area or Grand Round, it was really brought to understand the history of those people 
and the vote actually turned out where they did name the school off Lottie Ridge and there's much more education coming around that. And so that's um, kind of that flip side of it. So being named off Lottie Ridge isn't a stereotypical mascot, it's an honoring for the people whose land that school is on, which is a beautiful thing in my opinion. There's a school right down the road from where we live now, it's called Indian Hills. Nobody really knows why it's called that. Why is it called Indian Hills? There's no hills right here. Maybe there, <laughs> you know, we don't know what tribe was here, assuming it was Tualatin and Kalapuya. Um, so, you know, in the schools, we're talking to like, where did that name come from and why is it there? And through the Native American Parent Advisor Committee, they are looking at like, how can we have that school's name change? If there's no reason for it, what is the purpose of it being there? You know, in, in Alaska, so my family's from Huna, which is in Southeast Alaska. Um, they are called, um, I believe they're called the Warriors. And in our village, you know, they have an indigenous mascot. They have an indigenous person as their mascot. So a lot of the conversations happen like, so how is it okay here and not okay here? And that comes back to the depreciation and appropriation question, right? So if it's the people who are of that culture and they are supporting something, there, there's no reason for us to judge them for wanting to lift up their culture in that way because that's them, it's their culture. But if it's another culture taking on or using it for their own benefit, that's that flip side of appropriation. So um, I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question really, but I, I definitely have mixed feelings about it. I think I, I I like to, like I mentioned before, dive in and understand something a little deeper and um, not reacting to it immediately just because I see the visual like on social media. I like to dive deeper and learn about it and then react. And I think that's important because we don't know if in Huna they're called warriors because in Vietnam, when Vietnam happened, the majority of all the indigenous men who lived in our little village went to Vietnam. So are they honoring them as warriors through that name? I don't know the answer to that, but that's where my mind goes. So um, having an open mind, having empathy and understanding and not just reacting and assuming the worst and everything, but assuming the best and then understanding from there would be how I, I perceive it and how I react to it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add? I think Auntie, I think Auntie Heather pretty much summed it up for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Sometimes my brain just explodes at the thought of, you know, like an entire community being known for something that's inaccurate and disrespectful. So, and even what you said, Auntie Heather, about like, you know, educating yourself, not, you know, jumping, jumping to conclusions. Sometimes I don't have that patience. And, you know, cause I've, it's, <laughs> it's hard to be considerate when the model minority myth becomes like such a standard in schools and sports. So for you guys as cultural practitioners who have experienced so much of this, I'm in awe of how you handle it and uh, especially what you're doing to educate others. So thank you. Mahalo. Our next question comes from Kina. Mahalo. With cultural hate crimes on the rise in America, what would you or the youth say to support a concerned family? Auntie Tavai or Mika could go, Mika or Auntie Charlie could go first. Mm -mm. Uh, sorry, I kind of didn't hear the question. Uh, something about hate, hate crimes, crimes on the and rise. on the rise. And what would you say to what would I say to a concerned family? A concerned family, like a concerned family that's being hated on. Yeah. Or both sides, because I have a lot to say to the other side that's doing all the hate. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> um, I'm just being honest. <laughs> but to the other family who feels, you know, the hate and stuff, just to let them know that there's a huge community behind them who supports them, who will malama them and just uplift them 
when they're afraid and they're not alone fighting through all of all of that hate mm. and injustice and mm-hmm. yeah I think that's the best thing that we can do to uplift another family is just really show our support for them and um, malama them as best as we can. Yeah. Sorry for the, not for the haters out there. No. <laughs> we always get something for say for them. <laughs> you need to educate yourself. No. <laughs> Anything, Kina, you know, sorry. Of course, I just jump. Sorry, just jumping in. Um, you know, I think when we when we talk about the hate crimes and and, and maybe if I, as you can understand this another little bit, you folks are referring to the hate crimes that's happening right now, correct? We're looking at Asian Asian American hate crimes, right? And so I think when we talk about when we when we look at hate crimes and you know what Auntie Tiva said, especially for our Pacific Islander communities or all Indigenous communities. They have to understand that there is a lot of people behind them. We are here and we are willing to support. But when we talk about the Asian American hate crimes, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conversation piece on its own, right? Especially because right now, as Pacific Islanders, we are working to dismantle this idea that we keep being grouped together, right? We keep being in this place where we are Asian American Pacific Islander. And we need to first understand that both communities and the disparities of each community is very different, right? Yeah, it's very different. Um, the the issues and 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 the needs for each community is very different. And so, when we're looking at Asian American and for Asian American hate crimes and and for you know we go back to what Sophia was saying with um that model minority myth, yeah, as far as what people see Asians to be, that's a different conversation and. And to those families who need support, you know, I think, and, and I'm sure I can speak for many Indigenous cultures, is that to understand that we are standing in solidarity with you, you know, through all of it, through through the chaos that we have seen through COVID, right, from, from the issues with our Black Lives Matter to the issues with the, the Asian hate crime. I mean, the, the, ish, the list of issues could be long, right? The issues we see in our Indigenous, in, in the Native American communities, and all of that is hate crimes. When when you are, when your purpose and your intention is to hurt one person, you're hurting the whole community, and and that is and it's and it is on the rise. But you know, and I always quote her because I love her. I I call her my friend. She may not know it, but I know it. But Michelle Obama, right? She tells us when people go low, we go high. And we have to remember that no matter what it does, we have to be there for our family. So for all the different communities who, you know, I've shared space with communities who have said, you know, but we we have issues and we have this and, and we do, but the first thing we have to, in order for all of us to rise is we have to stand in solidarity with each other. And we have to understand that each community have different has different disparities. And so if you are a concerned family out there, you know, know all of us remember our faces remember our our organizations you have confluence you have kalo you have you have oranui we're here and no matter how much hate crimes happen we not going anywhere and we will continue to stand and we will continue to fight and like auntie tevai said to the haters but we're going to do it very gracefully grace gracefully like auntie heather we have a lot to say to them but the work that you folks are doing and creating these spaces and having conversations, that work is by far more than any of us could say could be happening right now. So yeah. And Auntie just I did a Mika and I just went all over the place too. So you're not the only one, Mika. Well, I'd love to share something really quickly on that if I can too. Um as a parent, you never want to have to have conversations like this with your children. Um, and so I've had friends and community who've experienced things with their children in their schools um, and community. And one of the, the most important things that I share with people is don't pretend it didn't happen. Talk about it, find somebody to talk about it. Talk with your children about it, even if it's hard. Um, you know, our children, are gonna be faced with things that we probably can't even imagine. And if they're not prepared, 
not scared of it, not living in fear every moment, but prepared to the reality of what could happen, they might be in a more unsafe situation. They might react differently or have um, something happen. And, you know, I had to talk with my 10-year-old little boy about, you know, what happened with George Floyd and talking about him being a man of color and what that means if something were to happen in his life, if he got pulled over as a teenager or, and you don't want to have to have those conversations, but they're important to have because we don't know in this world that we're living in. And if we pretend it's not happening, we're participating in it, right? We're allowing it to exist and be a part of our narrative because we're not willing to talk about it and be uncomfortable. Because when we're uncomfortable, that's where we can learn and that's where we can grow. Um, and so I always advocate, you know, don't pretend it didn't happen. Don't pretend that it's not happening. Talk about it. Because that's how you also take away the power from those other people by talking about it and being real about it and letting it know that it's not acceptable and that we aren't going to allow it to happen in our communities. So I think that's just so important mm -hmm. to not shield our children from the realities of the world. Let's not scare them, but let's be real with them. Thank you. I think um, just playing off of her um, with saying about like the youth and stuff like that, really letting the youth know what's up <laughs> and how to handle the situations. Um, we had a situation with Mika in school where we ain't going to call out her school, but <laughs> it's majority, you know, like she was pretty much one of three brown kids in her school mm -hmm. and that somebody said something to her and it was not okay and just the way you know talking to them i never thought i had to have this conversation with my kids and i feel like growing up in hawaii we were sheltered from a lot of what like of what hate crimes are because we're such a like diverse group in hawaii that um i never saw myself having to talk to my kids about these kind of issues but it's important it's really important for us to have these conversations. And just by her, the experience with her, we have these conversations now with our kids. Yeah. And things like with my younger son and it, it's rough and it's scary maybe a little bit to have the conversations with them because of the world that we live in, but they need to know that it's not okay and they can make a difference. They can make a change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now I understand the difference between like having the conversation and keeping it away. And then like later they're gonna be like, what is that? Um, and I actually didn't know what was happening with the Asian people before we had our video with not completely talk story. And then I asked my mom, what's stop asian hate like what's all this stuff happening so yeah <laughs> thank you and kina can i have to ask you so when you asked mom about what stop asian hate meant did you when you had that conversation with mom did you appreciate that you had an open conversation or or what was your take on that um it kind of made me sad to know that people actually did that to um, Asians and they don't really deserve that because they shouldn't be, um, I'm sorry. They shouldn't be discredited for who they are and it's really not fair. Big hugs, big hugs. I know. I know. Trish, hug Kina. Oh, you're just making all of us cry now. But she's right. You're right, Kina. They should not be discredited for who they are. Mahalo. Sorry. And continue. Thank you, Thank you Kina and everyone. Um, really, they really shouldn't be hated on because they're Asian. Anyone shouldn't be hated on who, for who they are. Um, our next question comes from Chloe. Okay, 
Mahalo, Kina. So um, going off of everything you guys talked about, you like mentioned situations where you've had to like confront people or you haven't confronted people for things that they've said to you. So how can we advocate against cultural mis misrepresentation when it's like inflicted on us or if we just see it? And what are more impactful ways that we can educate our community and the people around us? And if we can start with Antile again. Yes, sorry, Kalamai. I was I was listening to the question and, and then not sorry, because you know she's the back end of here. Could you please repeat the question? Yes. So how can we advocate against cultural misrepresentation and what are more impactful ways that we can educate the community? Mahalo. Again, this is important on, on, on paying attention and listening, especially when you are a panelist on the panel. Um, how can we, how can people advocate against cultural misrepresentation? Um, and what are more impactful ways to educate the community? So how can we advocate? This is advocating for cultural misrepresentation. What you folks are doing as Nakamali Itak story, what you folks have been doing for the past year is advocating for cultural misrepresentation. Um, our regalia is very important and, you know, people, and, and, to, and even for me, right, I have to try to learn to, get away from us calling our, our hula costumes, right? And because I think that's where people get this understanding that it's a costume. And really it's like, even for me, right? That's me decolonizing myself on how to, on, on how to help with the misrepresentation of, of culture. And one of them is, you know, we call our regalia costumes as well, right? And so people are saying that. So that's, that's one way, yeah. How can people advocate against cultural misrepresentation is also learning to that, that even though we are indigenous people, we too play a huge role in how we can decolonize ourselves, and how we can, can step away from what our colonizers have, has, have put upon us, um, you know, just simply using, you know, saying regalia versus our, our customs, right? Um, the impactful ways to educate the community again goes with what you folks are doing already. You know, with Nakamani Talk Story, the continuation of being able to have conversation. Conversation is also education. Having meaningful discussions is education. And something Auntie Heather said earlier, you know, maybe everybody might not take to it. Some people may just be stuck in their ways and they're not going to hear it. But if you're in a room of a hundred people, and you have this conversation and you educate people about culture and one person, it it reaches one person, then that's one more person you had before you started. And that's the only way we can really advocate against cultural misrepresentation is the continuous conversations. And um, a big part of that, you know, coming from Hawaii, uh, when I first moved up to the continent, I was I would get so offended and always on the defense and 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 just upset about when people would question my Hawaiian-ness or they would make fun of something or they would and through the years I've learned that we can't get upset we can't just immediately get to the place it's so hard let me tell you the patience level is still a hard factor I work on that every day but um we have to kind of step back and understand the way to best advocate is to step back and understand that they are in a world history I say this often History works against them. The people here on the continent do not have the means of education the way that we do. You know, like for you folks, Chloe, you folks are fortunate enough to be a part of a halal, right? That that you have grown up in a world where you know that Hawaii was overthrown. You know that our queen was in prison. You know that our language was forbidden. Yeah. And then you then with the work that we've been doing with the Native American tribes here in Oregon you folks are fortunate enough to learn from them. And unfortunately, that's not happening in our schools. So in a room of 30 students, you may be the only student that's in the room that has, has that knowledge. And the way to advocate is to be that person to to speak up. You know, if you're in a class, I think Mema, Mema was telling me she was so excited because um, 
Beaverton High School social studies class um, was teaching about the Hawaiian overthrow. You know, when, when our, our Hawaii went into overthrow and, or not went into, when we were overthrown and our people and, and Hawaii was stolen. And for me, I was, I was excited that it was being educated, but I was also hesitant because I was like, are you educating them cor correctly? And so my first question was like, oh, is that person from Hawaii? And sometimes I have to not always go to that place, right? Sometimes I have to believe that there are people out there who took the time to go and learn. There are many people out there who have recognized the the um, the lack there of education, right? When it comes to that. So there are people out there, um, but I still question it. I still question like, are you teaching our kids the right information? Um, and if you're not, can you reach out to the people who can? So that is how we can impactful, be impactful when we're educating the community. Um, ask the right people for the information. And, and I will hand it over. Yeah, we, we can take over. Go ahead. <laughs> um, definitely education. Um, and we believe uh, an impactful way to educate is by starting with our kids, like how you guys are doing what you're doing now uh, by teaching, you know, our kids to um, appreciate and respect all the different cultures and to learn about them and to understand them um, that way in the future there won't be any appropriation because everybody you know like when you brought up the question i was over here with my hands my are going education 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 <laughs> like for a big like, time it's it really is it comes down to the education and i feel like i know there's a question about education but <laughs> I'm just gonna throw it out there. Like education is so important for our youth and not just our youth, but the community. Like being in, growing up in Hawaii, right? We all have Hawaiian history. I call it, should I say it? <laughs> so I call it um, whitewash Hawaiian studies <laughs> because it's not, it's not like the real, you don't get the real Hawaiian studies. And it wasn't until I hit college, believe it or not, and Uncle, you know, Kim Kealan, who bless his soul, he was there to educate educate me and be like, look, this is the real Hawaiian history that they don't teach you in schools. And I was upset. And I'm like, why? Why are they not teaching this in school? Why are we letting our own kids, like our own children of Hawaii, grow up not knowing these things? And I, I, I can go on and on about that. But... Um, just having it in the school system, period. We are here on Native American lands. Why do we not have a class on Native American history and of the clans of that area, like what or the tribes of that area? Why do we not teach that in school? Like for me, it is so important. Like you need to know what, like you need to know the history, period, of any land that you walk into, know the history. Why is it not being taught in schools? Like that's something that I'm very like passionate about. As yeah, as you can see, my sister gotta like squeeze my leg over here because she's like, don't don't get too worked up. But, <laughs> but it's having it in our school systems because it really does start with our keiki mm -hmm. and their upbringing. They're they're the next generation, yeah, they're and the generation. if we can teach them, we set the foundation. We set the foundation for them then all the future generations after that, hopefully we won't be talking about misrepresentation and appropriation or, you know, and they're going to know the history. They're going to know what is respect. They're going to know what is Malama Aina or like to Malama everybody and take care of the land and, you know, learn about the indigenous people, whose land they're on, who, like how their culture go. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just going to... No, I think they're biggest thing is for to teach our kids is that for a lot of us our culture is so um integrated into our identities yes we are our cultures you know as right be respectful of that when you re respect the person's culture you are respecting them their identity and who they are so i think that's the biggest thing to teach our kids like yeah. culture isn't just a separate thing it is that people and you know, like when I look at um, some of the youth, like 
I don't want to say out here, but <laughs> when we look at youth everywhere, you know, they have this whole thing about trying to find themselves and not knowing who they are. But for me, I'm just like, if you just dig into your culture a little bit, you know, you're going to find who you are. You're going to find the piece of your identity there. It might not make your whole identity, but you're going to find yourself there. And, you know, um, live your truth, speak your truth, be who you are, and not be afraid or ashamed to say, you know, hey, I'm Hawaiian or hey, I'm Native American or whatever it is that you are, whatever your culture is, like represent it and represent it hard and just be ma'a to who you are and your culture. And I feel like it really should be in the school systems. Like no ands, ifs, or buts, or maybes. <laughs> Bring it to the schools. Like who, what are you learning in school? Who, you know, what, what tribes were, are, where do we live you know like what tribes are from the area we are and stuff like that like we're coming to another place that's not ours but we should still respect it like it's ours you need to learn about it and educate yourself and i just education man 100 percent. okay i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> Well, I would love to talk about education, and that would be a great conversation to have in the future, too. And just so you know, Oregon and Washington, they have two amazing uh, laws that actually are in place now in Washington at since time immemorial. And here in Oregon, it's tribal history, shared history, where the tribe's voices have been brought together to build lessons and curriculum that are mandated to be taught in schools. And right now in Oregon, it's fourth, eighth, and tenth grade, and the intention is K through 12. Um, and these lessons are from the voices of the indigenous people. And then the tribes have also been building their own um, lessons that are being shared in their, their area. So that shift is happening. And it's, it's slow because, you know, we have a world that is just slow. And then COVID happened. But that's part of what I do is I help educate those educators so they feel more comfortable in um, teaching these lessons, even though they may not be indigenous themselves. And then in Washington... The mandate has been around for a while, but they didn't have the funding to implement it. So there's actually a bill um, in legislature right now that would fund that mandate and help them roll out those lessons. And so I encourage everybody to look at Since Time and Memorial from Washington State and Tribal History, Shared History in Oregon, and you can see what, what's being built. So there is hope there on education. It's just getting the educators to, to do it <laughs> and to implement it. Yeah. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's what I love to hear. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing. And I guess what I took away was that um, not only do we have a kuleana to share our knowledge with people, like we need to, if we know something, we, we owe it to the people who taught it to us to share it to as many people as we can so that they can understand the history and like the identity of so many different people. And then also if we are gonna be able to share all this knowledge that the people who can make decisions, like educators, people who make curriculum need to allow the space for us to be able to actually teach all this stuff. So, mahalo nui. Mahalo, Floyd, and everyone. Our next question comes from Haley. Mahalo. Um, my question can be for anyone. Uh, what are some strategies to find credible sources? <laughs> Nana Ike Kumu, look to the source, go straight to your sources, go to your kupuna, talk with them because your kupuna, I feel like, have a lot of history and a lot of knowledge. So, going to your elders and really just taking the time because, I mean, who has the time nowadays, right? Well, you do. You have the time to go and talk to your <laughs> elders, go to conferences, go to, um, wherever you can. I mean, Hawaii, go to museums. You know, all of these are great resources for you to learn and educate yourself. Don't wait for somebody to come to you and be like, hey, you know, like, 
take the time to go and learn and take the time to seek out the resources and uh, make sure fact check yourself as well. Well, I agree. Absolutely. Go to your elders. Our elders are so precious. And, you know, the way that our world works and the way that our life cycle works, we only have so much time with them. So definitely cherish that time and lift them up because they have stories to share that they want to share, you know, and they want to pass on for future generations. And read books. There's so many amazing books out there by Indigenous people, BIPOC people, um, that are of their voices, not about them. And that's the important thing, right? So we're not wanting people to talk about us or teach about us. We want them to come to us and lift up our voices and have be a part of the conversation alongside us. That's what we really want. So there's some amazing books out there. Um, and advocate and have conversations with people as well, because you don't know what a conversation can do for you. You know, you might be at school and not realize that, you know, your your peer has a similar path as you. Maybe they're indigenous or some a BIPOC person and that they have a similar path and that you could share with each other. But if you didn't start that conversation with them, you would never have known where they're coming from or who they are. So just that humanity with each other, I think is so important. It all comes down to relationships. So if anybody's been in my trainings, I know Leigh has, Auntie Leigh has, it's about relationships and it's so important. And try and stay away from Google because Google's great for a lot of things, but it's not the end all be all for who we are as BIPOC people. It is not, it's not our cultural Bible or resource. Our people are that for us. So relationships, relationships, relationships. Mahalo for sharing. Um, I agree. It's, it's really important to be able to like talk to our kupuna and ask for, for their wisdom. Uh, it's important to be skeptical of what we're reading or hearing, and fact, fact check our information, especially if we're sharing it. We have a question from the viewers. How has the intersectionality of your identities play a role in continuing to educate your Ohana and communities you are a part of? Anyone can answer this one. Well, I, I, I guess I could say something. <laughs> so I think about, um, I think about all the multifaceted parts of who I am as a human being and who I am and who I'm becoming every day, because I'm never, I'm never wanting to be one who knows everything about being indigenous or one that wants to know everything about um, being from my dad's side Dutch, you know, I, I don't want that. But what I want to do is continue to learn and grow and learn from people and help people have space where they can do that for themselves in their own lives. Um, and I think it plays a role because, you know, when I was younger, I didn't know I had permission to do that. You know, nobody says, hey, you have permission to live your life as you are because you are your unique person that creator has made you to be. I was told so many different things that I had to be this and I had to be that. And once I discovered that, hey, I have the opportunity, the unique gift from our creator to be the person that they've created me to be, and every piece of that matters, um, I was able to shift my lens in the direction that I went in my life. And I'm far from perfect, absolutely far from perfect, but I continue to learn and continue to grow. I think about our Portland All Nations canoe family. You know, here in Portland, um, we have over 20 tribes, nations, communities, and villages represented in our canoe family. And there's so many different pieces that come into the group. We're not all of the same background. We're not all of the same culture. We're unique cultures and independent individual villages and communities. But that doesn't stop us from coming together and practicing culture and living culture. It actually 
it actually makes us stronger because we're respecting each other for who we are and what we bring and lifting each other up and learning from each other. And I think one of the most amazing things about that is we provide space for not only indigenous people, but even non-indigenous people to be a part of that conversation and be a part of our existence, our humanity. Because if we start to like block people out from it and not have them be a part of it, just because we want to live our indigenous life and um, because it's been taken from us from historical trauma and the, the horrible things that have happened, we're perpetuating that cycle of the divide, right? So taking the opportunity to bring people into the fold with us and help them become allies. People use that term a lot or help them become respectful supporters. I think that's so important in all that we do. So um, I don't know if I really answered your question, but I, I just think it's so important that we recognize all the pieces and parts of us. I don't just say in community that I'm Klingit. I'm Klingit and I'm Dutch. So I'm Klingit from my mother's side and Dutch from my father's side. And each of those makes me the unique human being that I am. And I hope that other people can do that as well. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I, I tend to do word salads sometimes and I just keep going and going and going. So, um, but we all are unique and we all have the blessings from our creator that have created us who we are and give yourself permission to live that life and be that person um, without the blinders on that society and their colonial settler mindset makes us have. <clears throat> and just, and, and to add on to that, um, you know, as far as like, you know, how to, how, what is my role as far as like continuing to educate your honey communities you're a part of? And for me, you know, I am both, I am, I am both Asian and Pacific Islander, right? I am Asian, Pacific Islander, and um, uh, Irish, and but you know, of course, I have all of that as well, right? And for me, I choose not that I choose, but I am more in tune with my Pacific Islander connections. Um, because that is that is that is a choice that I've made, and that is, that is where I've I have been raised in to truly um, be able to understand who I am as a Hawaiian. And I think the reason for that was growing up in that culture, growing up in Hawaii, and having that being something that surrounds me, is why I identify more with that. That's I like, that's the community that I um, I tend to support more, or or, or I I love a thing too because of who you know that's that's my family you know when i look at my kupuna and the stories that i can get it's from that culture now that does not mean that i am less of anything else right i am like auntie heather said we are blessed to be who we are and we were created in that way before reason and um as far as my you know trying to trying to when I look at it, why I serve the Pacific Islander community, just to be frank, is because there's a lack thereof. And so I choose to work in this in this lane to educate and be a part of, not to not to be in a place to separate or or to continue to, to divide. It's because right now this community, this part of me needs that attention. This is the part of me that I need to guide and find a way because I'm very fortunate that the other part of me has a lot of, you know, there are resources that I could reach out to and, you know, and we could all weigh that out, right? All indigenous people, all of us, people of color, all BIPOC communities, we don't have enough resources. We could go and argue that for days. But right now, when I look at what community I serve, it is my Pacific Islander because we do not have that representation. We are, we, we, we don't have um, we don't have enough seats at the table. And I know this is, you know, for our for our Oha, our Native American Ohana as well. Like that is, you know, with this government, with this country, that is our argument. And so um for me that is that is the role I play as far as continue to educate um my Ohana and our communities is I choose that Pacific end of the route. Um but again that does not mean that I do not stand in solidarity with all that I am. And I do. I believe that I'm very blessed with the community and the cultures that I was born into. Um, I think for us, our role pretty much lines up with Lay's role as well, and what we're doing as far as educating the community and why we are we are a whole mix of Polynesian, and so for us. 
I think it's just super important for us to really take the time to look at our community, to uplift our community, support our community as best as we can and educate our community because we don't have the resources like other you know, cultures our communities do have. We don't have that. And I think it's um, that's kind of why our direction led us to that that same place. And um, we grew up in Hawaii and we grew up in this culture and we identify closest with this one. It's not like we don't identify with our other cultures. We do. But then at the same time, it's like when you go throughout the world, I mean... <laughs> We're talking about misrepresentation. We're misrepresented everywhere on the Polynesian side because there's not enough. There's not enough resources. There's mm -hmm. not enough information, not enough education. So I really feel like that's why we're here and our roles why to educate is, yeah, this is why we do what we do, to give, to be a resource for people yeah. of our culture. Yeah. yeah. Our cultures with us. And there's a, another comment out there that the whole panel are women. And we are. Thank you. Yeah. But says, yeah, but that doesn't, you know, Michael, Michael, next panel. <laughs> I just, yeah. Can I say something really quick about that last question too? Of course. I had a family member say to me, um, how come you're ignoring your Dutch side and only advocating for your indigenous side? And so it's exactly what all of you are saying. If there was a reason for me to be advocating for the Dutch side, if there was a reason that in this world that we have, that there were inequities and challenges and misinformation and history, absolutely, 100%, I would be out there advocating. But the reason I am doing the education I do is because there is that misrepresentation and that colonial settler mindset, which actually the Dutch people were a very big part of. You know? So, you know, to be for people like my family member to ask me to choose, that was really shocking to me that my identity isn't like an a la carte menu where I just pick what I want. It's who I am. And so it was just interesting to, to hear them think that of me. But then that made me think, well, that's because of where they are in their own personal journey as well. So I can't take that personally as much because that's representing their journey. So people might say things, especially with people who are um, multifaceted with their cultural backgrounds. But, you know, we just have to stand proud again. Like I said, I truly believe Creator made us, you know, unique and special as we are. So thank you for that wonderful question. Mahalo. Um, so as we start to close our, our session today, we would like to hand off the question to Sophia. Oh, thank you, Kohoku. Um, actually, before I ask my question, I just want to say that what we were talking about before, I thought it was really beautiful because I don't know, I might be, you know, one of the some people here who isn't really ingrained in their culture and, you know, the intersectionality in my family would be my grandparents who were kind of ashamed of sharing their language and anything regarding their culture. So today, my parents, my brother, you know, everyone kind of feels lost for culture. And anytime we try to celebrate our traditions or anything like that, we kind of feel like imposters. And so it's so beautiful to hear that everyone is trying to perpetuate and, you know, just pass on to the next generations. Because I'm definitely going to do that. It's not too late. But my question, seriously, <laughs> um, is through media specifically, have you ever witnessed sources, including local news channels, advertisements, commercials, or journals, who you know did not fact check their work? If so, did you hesitate in contacting them in any way in order to correct their way of misrepresent misrepresentation? Uh, anyone can go. we we'll like go first. Um, <laughs> I feel like we could, we could go about this. Um, it has a little bit to do with what we talked about earlier. So it sounds like I'm gonna go first. Is that what we're 
because I, I saw two of my goal. Um, you know, yes, 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 yes. Um, if so, did you hesitate in contacting them? So, you know, um, when I first moved to the continent, that answer is yes. I was hesitant because it, it came from a place where it was like just defensive. I was like, you know, you just upset about it because, you know, why are you asking me if I came here on an air? Like, how did I get here? How did you get here? You know, like, why are you folks making these 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 notions and you're using it as advertisement and and um you know and when it comes to that media place right that big question about media that's where so much of cultural misappropriation misrepresentation like really is funneled through that avenue like the media has given those ideas a platform and it, it has allowed it to be built on all of that. And so, you know, um, there's definitely so much of that's happening and it's still happening. Even with everything that's going on, it's still happening. And you know that they're not fact checking. Um, you know, one of the things that to just locally, right? If I was, you know, you don't want to call everybody out, but um, this goes with me now. If do I hesitate to do I hesitate to reach out now? No, I don't. So, for example, um, Good Day Oregon or Co Coin News or or On the Go with Joe, you know, when they're doing cultural programs and they're they're out there sharing, oh, that this community is doing this. Our ask is always that they fact check because they're not. You know, they're displaying. You know, for me, I'm going to talk for Hawaiian culture. They're displaying. Um, organizations who are using Hawaiian culture as a way, as a means for, for money. Yeah, they're monopolizing on the idea and, and, and they're taking this whole Hawaiian culture and, and people are monopolizing on it. And the media, especially here in Oregon, are giving them a place and a platform to continue that misappropriation. And no matter, you know, they do need to fact check. And have we reached out 100%? There has been multiple people within our halal. There has been multiple people within Kalo who have, we have written letters, we have written emails. And I can tell you right now, none of those, none of them are getting responses. And so um, we're going to continue. So as many times as, as they're going to be on the news and they're going to continue to misrepresent our culture, we're going to come 10 times more. And we're going to continue to stand. We're going to continue to, to speak up and say, and so, you know, um, to all of all of our people who are a part of our who are cultural practitioners and not and a cultural practitioner, you know, this the saying of cultural practitioner, people want to believe it's just like, you know, just a kumu or no, a cultural practitioner is every single one of us who was born with the privilege of being indigenous. And we forget the we forget that it is a privilege that we are indigenous people. We forget that it is a privilege for us to be people of color and we need to use that privilege for good. And we have to remember that we should not hesitate. Yeah, it is a privilege for us to be who we are and we have to use that and we have to make sure that we have to continue to speak up because the question, right? If we don't, then who? If we don't educate, then who? If we don't make the change, then when? When and who will make the change? So don't hesitate, um, but do it as do it gracefully, like Auntie Heather. Um, I had I learned a lot from her today about how to be graceful about it. So please be graceful, but don't hesitate. Well, thank you. I try to be graceful. It doesn't always happen. So be gentle with yourself if you're not graceful, because you can learn from it. <laughs> Um, you know, I wanted to share that, you know, during the election, CNN had put on a demographic breakdown of cultural representation who are voting. They put the Native American culture as something else. You might have all seen this. You know, there were T-shirts and things made because indigenous communities, we like to laugh and we make we make fun of things and, and have humor about things that are sometimes not the best things to laugh about. But that's how we get through. Right. And so the something else movement really happened. And, um, you know, 
that's just the thing of it. There is this historical mis misrepresentation or erasure or um, invisibility of BIPOC people in media. And uh, there's a really great organization called Illuminatives, um, and they are doing all they can to lift up Indigenous voices and BIPOC communities, to have them be represented, to be present, to be seen in media, to be seen in Hollywood, to be seen, because we don't see people like us. And that's what our children need to see. Um, most recently, though, uh, on CNN again, there was a, a commentator, his name is Santorum, and he made comments at a at a speech where he said, we birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but candidly, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. So this happened like over a month ago and there's been petitions and people coming together and writing letters to CNN to fire him because that is horribly inaccurate and horribly racist and horribly just ever all about wrong. Um, and so it's been a bit disheartening because we haven't seen anything happening that, you know, we've done petitions and letters and saying, this is not okay. Even one of their anchors, Don Lemon, who who's black, he was like very upset and saying, you know, he came on, he didn't apologize. He kept justifying what he said. He didn't get it. He didn't get that he was wrong and he just needed to apologize and learn from it. Yesterday though, and I don't know if any of you saw this, but Rick Santorum was fired, which was great because that is what we need to see. We need to see consequences for these behaviors that are happening, for this racism that happens. We need to see consequences so that people don't think that it's okay for this to perpetuate and that continue to continue to happen. But if we don't stand up and if we don't say something, if we don't sign petitions or make phone calls or send emails, then just like Auntie Leigh was saying, nothing's gonna happen because we didn't do anything. So it's scary, it's nerve wracking, just when people say, write your legislators, write, call your legislator's office. It's intimidating and scary for everybody. But if we don't do it, who's gonna do it? Who's gonna speak for us? Nobody. So it is, it is a responsibility for us to be indigenous and it's a privilege and it's one of the most beautiful things that we've been given. Um, and we have to stand up for ourselves and for each other. So thank you. I think that's um, the yeah they pretty much summed it up for us. But um, signing petitions and writing letters and just letting them know, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Um, I'm not as graceful as Auntie Heather, and um, yeah. so my mouth stay shut and I just write letters and my mom looks it over before I send any letter out to make sure that it's, you know, good, appropriate. appropriate. <laughs> and yeah, don't be afraid to speak up and speak for what's right. Our, our mom is supposed to be related because my mom got to look over my stuff too. <laughs> Well, my stuff usually sits on my computer for days before I hit send and I go back and I look at it and then I look at it again and then I look at it again and go, hmm, I probably shouldn't say that. And then finally I hit send. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I have to admit, it's really embarrassing that there's been many times that I watched a video and something felt super wrong but I didn't do anything to support my culture because I thought I didn't hold the power or privilege to speak up. Uh, now, I think that's stupid. And the encouragement I've gotten to, you know, do it for myself, do it for my family, uh, do it for my halal is incredible. And I even think back to what Auntie Heather said about living culture. And it's, it's so much more than just like a duty. And yeah. I'm 100% taking that advice. Mahalo. You know, Sophia, um, before you go off, I think when we're raised, when we're brought up, we are um, taught to be respectful. And maybe you haven't spoken up because you feel like it's um, you're going to be disrespectful to your elders or whoever it may be or anything like that. But you just kind of have to remember, like, you, you have a voice and you should use it whenever you know you feel like there's something there's an injustice or something that you feel isn't right mm -hmm. um and for all of our youth to remember that yeah because i think we grew up a lot like that too we didn't want to make 
pilikia or problems with anybody and we just bit our tongues for the most part and stayed quiet but there has to come a point where you cannot be quiet and you need to speak up for yourself and you know do it in a respectful gracious way but let them know what's up <laughs> <laughs> yeah if there was any if there was any time to use your voice to all of the youth that are out there who are on the coming talk sorry and who's out watching this panel the time is now and i think the thing about for all of us being indigenous people and being people of color and when and like auntie tiff i was saying a lot of us grew up with that notion that you know we can't say anything and it's taken a lot of us it took it's taken a lot of time for us to find a place for us to use our own voices and how do we do that but the thing that i love about watching all of you and watching our, our youth of color is that you folks use your voices but that sense of respect the sense of respect that you folks have for your elders even though you know that you may walk into a space where there could be an argument there could be a disagreement um is something that you know i mahalo and and that is a, that is a hats off to your makua your ohana and the villages that are raising all of you to do that because um i if to be your age i would not have had that much grace the way that you folks do it so mahalo to all of you mahalo i mean seriously i was taught all my life to like not talk back but you know there's just sometimes like it just bundles into anger when i hear stereotypes coming out of you know people's mouths and i'm like oh my gosh well, i gotta say something now and I'm glad that, you know, I feel that way <laughs> and I can actually speak up. So. You know, with going off of that, um, the whole not speaking or the whole talking back and stuff like that, first off, don't talk back to your parents. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, doing it in a respectful manner and rising above it, that is going to be more impactful and you'll feel more empowered instead of lashing out and stooping down to their level and just being angry. I mean, be angry, but do it in the most, you know, respectful and show humility because you know why you're teaching them a lesson mm -hmm. and you're showing them your strength and your by being able to restrain yourself from going to their level and just lashing out like crazy, you know, you're teaching them a lesson as well. And you're going to be the bigger person because of that. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you for this amazing conversation. Um, before we close today, I would like to invite our students to help to put this thing together um, to introduce themselves. Kina. Aloha, my name is Kina. I am 10 years old. I attend Hillsborough School District as a fifth grader, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And we love you. Know, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You're a winner. Chicken dinner. <laughs> <sighs> I love you, Kina. Next this is up air is hugging. Me. We're air hugging you. <laughs> Mema. Aloha, my name is Mema. I am I'm 14 years old and I attend Beaverton School District as a freshman. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. Mahal. Sophia. We will practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, uh, I'm Sophia, and I'm a seventh grader in the Beaverton School District, and I identify as Japanese, German, Chinese, Filipino. Damn. Wow. Nguyen Lenny? Aloha. My name is Nguyen Lenny, and I'm a freshman in the Beaverton School District, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as Japanese and Native Hawaii. Haley. Aloha, my name is Haley. I'm a sophomore in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I identify as Japanese and Portuguese. 
Chloe. Hi, my name is Chloe. I'm 15 years old and I'm a freshman in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as Mexican and Puerto Rican. And unfortunately, one of us can't aren't here today because they had to go someplace. But Kule is 17 years old and she attends um, school in the Beaverton School District and her pronouns are she, her, hers. Mahalo nui lo to all of our amazing panelists and to all of you that has joined us today. We hope that today's talk story session has helped you understand and answer many of the questions you also had. Like we said before, we hope to use this platform as a safe space for all youth to come together and talk about the issues that we, a key component of today's society, are faced with as we move into the future. No subject is off limits. We hope to continue these sessions weekly and we need you, our peers, friends, and family. For more information or ways to be involved, please email info at callohcc.org or, or visit www.callohcc.org. Thank you. Mahalo. <laughs>